Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Today, going to talk a little bit about uh, carbon monoxide poisoning and some things you can look for when you encounter these types of patients or you suspect that something might be going on. Um, I actually had a story uh, years back where I actually had a call, and uh, it was for nausea vomiting, and it was in a, a high-rise building in New York City, and it ended up being that the boiler had recently been worked on and was actually poisoning most of the occupants of the building. And my partner and I both were affected by inhaling the gases as well and ended up being an actual uh, an MCI in the process. So the, the good part about it was that my partner and I sort of realized that there was a little bit more than going on in this person's house that called us because the entire family was having nausea vomiting, then uh, while we were there, we had two pediatric patients that actually started to seize on us. And we immediately knew that it was more than just a common illness going on. And we put together the fact of the recent work on the boiler and things like that to lead us to, to believe that it was a carbon monoxide gas poisoning. And it ended up having to evacuate the building. And we ended up getting uh, exposed to the gases in our attempts to uh, evacuate the building and get these people out of the building. Um, so it, it's important, I think, to know that these types of um, poisoning, while might not be all that common, uh, this is the type of thing which sort of imitates a lot of different diseases or illnesses. And you got to really sort of put these things together as far as your patient assessment and events leading up to what was going on to sort of put things together. You don't always find these patients at the fire scenes, right? It's not always at a fire scene. So just keep that in mind. So let's just quickly talk about this real quick, that you know, carbon monoxide is colorless, it's flavorless, it's odorless, and it's a non-irritating type of, of gas. Um, you know, it, it actually heaters are one of the most common things you're gonna find that ends up being the source of a sort of household or domestic CO exposure. Now, CO binds with hemoglobin, right? And it actually binds 250 times more readily than uh, uh, your oxygen, okay? So what ends up happening is the patient is actually suffocating uh, on a cellular level, okay? So when you're looking at these types of patients again, Suspect it in any sort of fire type um, call you're on, smoke inhalation, or uh, closed space, okay? And just keep in mind that the end title SpO2, you might get a normal reading on that. It's not going to necessarily detect that there is an issue with um, the uh, CO levels of a patient, okay? So you have to look at the signs and symptoms of these patients. Now, you do have things out there like uh, uh, CO oximeters, right? These are, are, have been out for a while. More and more ambulances are now keeping these because uh, we are responding to a lot of fire calls and rehab and things like that. Um, so it's important to uh, just familiarize yourself with this. And, if, you know, if your agent doesn't have it, you know, you can get a grant, actually, to try to pay for this device. It's kind of expensive, but you know what? It can it actually can read different levels of oxygen for your patient uh, depending upon a device um, and you can actually get a good reading and get let you know what's going on and I have some levels here these are sort of the common levels where you're gonna have no treatment versus treatment um, at the end here you'll see 12% or higher right treat and transport now a lot of times over 12%, 15% depending upon a patient's age uh, the patients end up having to get into hyperbaric uh, treatment to help alleviate the CO poisoning. Okay, a lot of times the high concentration of oxygen doesn't always work or displace the CO. So, you know, just keep that in mind that, you know, higher than 12% using this type of device, you get 25%, 15% for PEDS. Uh, you might want to be calling at the hospital ahead of time and getting some guidance or even consider transferring the patient directly to a hospital that has hyperbaric chambers. All right, so some signs and symptoms. You got your, you know, they can be weak, uh, general malaise, a headache, uh, confusion or dizziness, nausea, shortness of breath, 
um, maybe may appear very drowsy to you, and then you get some serious uh, end of it as well, right? Some some things going on where the patient might be unconscious. They might have chest pain. They might even develop an MI or a pulmonary embolism as well. Look for rails and ronchi when you listen to their lung sounds. And again, I mentioned the call that I was on. Patients can actually have seizures as well in relation to this. Now, one thing you might be asking is about that cherry red skin, right? We hear about that. Oh, cherry red skin, cherry red skin. Well, for uh, seal poisoning, it is a sign, right? But normally it is a late sign. You're probably going to see a lot of these other signs and symptoms before you get to the cherry red skin. So just kind of keep that uh, in, in the, the front of your mind there. Now, some management. A lot of times it's just supportive, guys. You're going to protect yourself and your partner, get the patient to fresh air. Remember your ABCs, of course, and give them the high concentration oxygen. The high flow oxygen is what's going to help the patient uh, get that suffocation at that cellular level I mentioned and sort of displace the CO molecules, okay, getting them out of where they're not supposed to be, okay. Um, think about things like giving the patient oxygen, consider the ventilation, maybe even intubation is going to depend upon, you know, are we at that level of where they are unconscious, unresponsive, not being able to maintain their airway, as you know, you might end up having to intubate these types of patients, okay? A lot of the ones we see, guys, are what? It's basic headache stuff, right? Basic dizziness or maybe some mild confusion or feeling weak. That's what we're getting. And a lot of times, the high kind of oxygen, the ABCs, monitoring and transport is what we're going to end up doing. But you will be having patients, you know, at times where they're going to be having this severe poison. They're going to be above that 15% I mentioned, that 20, even 25%. And they're going to need more aggressive treatment, and that's when you're going to be ending up uh, thinking about the ventilation or even intubation of these pa of these patients. Do the transport, and again, consider uh, taking to a facility that has a hyperbaric chamber, and uh, you know, don't delay seeing treatment for these guys. You know, get them to the hospital. They're going to need radial blood gases drawn up on these patients, and again, a lot of time the pa the, the treatment ends up pretty much just being supportive for these types of patients. But consider the entire scene, how the patient's presenting, what you can do for them on scene versus what can be done at the hospital in the hyperbaric chambers and radial blood gases and things like that. Guys, I hope you can use these Monday Minutes. I know this is a quick little spurt here on this topic, but I wanted to point out some key signs and symptoms, some key treatment things that you can do to start getting your patient treated and get into the hospital. Uh, if you have some minutes of your own, be sure to send them on over to me. It's uh, my email address. It's jhoffman at ems-safety.com. I'd uh, love to hear what minutes you'd like to see here on the, the weekly episode, and I'll be sure to go ahead and try to uh, get a presentation together for you. Guys, if you enjoyed this, I will say uh, we've got a pretty cool uh, EMS quick study guide over on the main website at emsseo.com. It's in the study resources area. Uh, I've got a link below as well in the notes here. But this study guide, it's about a little bit over 100 pages. It really contains all the nice little nuts and bolts of things that are great to know and understand in EMS, okay? Um, it's a great thing to use to sort of reference for uh, just before an exam, but it's also a nice little go-to thing to sort of get the key points and components of different areas of patient care, signs and symptoms, okay? And really can put things together for you and maybe even connect them to the dots for you guys. Nice and concise. There's actually a digital download version and a physical version you can uh, access at the website. So go check that out. Um, I think it's well worth uh, you know owning this and adding it to your EMS library. Guys, that's it for me. Be sure to leave some comments below and I'd love to hear what you have to say about, about this show, guys. Let me know. I, I want to hear your feedback. Until next week, as always, guys, Jim Hoffman, Monday Minutes. Stay safe.